just working on a botanical painting this evening. This is the sketch that I was doing the other night. I started painting it this morning. And this is so far how far I've gotten <laughs> all day long. And that's what I did. Well, I guess not all day. I had some childcare going on, so maybe five hours today. In case you're wondering what all the this stuff is, that's a mask that I cut out from scrap paper so that I don't drop speckles of paint all over into what will be white areas of this picture. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty awesome. This is, so let's see, Wild Wing, Wild Wing Acres is asking what I'm working on. This is a botanical painting of some succulents that I have. It's called, the, the plant is called Dudleya. And they are pretty amazing looking at this time of year. Well, I think because I'm a succulent fanatic, in case you didn't figure that out from the whole coloring book I made of succulents. But yeah, this is a this is one of my plants and they have this beautiful chalky blue color to the leaves. And in the summertime when it gets really warm, the tips of the leaves turn bright pinkish red. So then you get this wide range of wide range of colors from the the very pink reddish tips down through the greenish blue of the leaves and I really like that so I wanted to do a painting of it. And they also have these pretty tiny little yellow flowers. If you have any random questions about anything at all, feel free to shoot them my way. I might not notice it at first because I'm head down looking at the painting, but I'll, I'll look up at my screen every once in a while. Yeah, yeah pork and beans are one of my other favorites too. I like them. They're so cute. Actually, I think that was one of the first ones that got me started in succulent collecting. People sometimes look at my botanical paintings and they think that I am painting, well, they think that I, I do it with colored pencils. And the reason is because I do a lot of this dry brush technique where I just kind of do these short sketchy strokes with a very tiny brush. Let's see, can you see that? Is that in focus? There it is. Yeah, so I use this really tiny brush. <laughs> I do these short little strokes of it. And when you look up close, when I show a detailed up close view of one of these botanical paintings, it has a little bit, I guess, of the colored pencil look because they'll see all the little strokey things that I'm doing. But it is not colored pencil. It is all with watercolor. I like watercolor much more than colored pencil or watercolor pencils. I get people asking if I've tried watercolor pencils before too and the answer is I've tried them but I've never found much use for them because I feel like they're not versatile enough. 
because I can't get all the colors that I want versus my brush tip where I can just, you know, mix and grab any color I need. And so the palette is a lot wider. Yeah, this is a number zero brush. But number zero, they they range even within different brands. I mean, one one brand's number zero is going to look like another's number two. You know, these are both supposedly number zeros. And you can see even from this picture, the, the, this, uh, sorry, not picture. Well, you can see over there that there's quite a difference. And one of them is twice as thick as the other. So it doesn't really mean a whole lot. I, I use itty bitty brushes. <laughs> we, we can leave it at that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't like watercolor pencils even. I felt they were too blunt of an instrument. And also then I, I wouldn't be able to use all the wonderful pigments I've collected. <laughs> My friend was just saying the other day about how she was talking to a, I think it was either an oil painter or an acrylic painter, and this this oil or acrylic painter was wondering why do watercolor artists get all batty about all their different pigments? Why do we, why do you guys need to have like eighty tubes of paint <laughs> versus versus uh, acrylics and oils where they're pretty happy with. A standard set of you know maybe 20 colors I don't know it's been so long since I've painted with acrylics I don't even know any longer but with watercolors it's just every single pigment it's not it's not just the color it's the transparency of it it's the granulation it's how it interacts when you mix it with other colors there's just so many different variables that make them much more uh it makes it it makes it so that you want to have them all How's the resolution on this video? Are you are you ever able to see what I'm even doing here? Or should I try to zoom in more if, if I can? Hello. Yeah, it is. It is pretty small. <laughs> this is actually a not terribly expensive one. I bought them so long ago, though. They were from Utrecht. I don't know if Utrecht art is even around anymore. Um, I, all I know is the locations that I used to go to for Utrecht have all long since become uh, Blick art stores. But this was a Utrecht brand from the store when I bought it. And I, I bought like a pack of 20 of them at the time, maybe for $2 each. All right, let me see if I can zoom. I don't know if it's possible. Ugh. How's that look? Is that better? Yeah, I think they were bought by Blick. That, that would explain why all the stores got transformed right around then. But I don't know if they still even have make these brushes then because this was this was the Utrecht brand brush.
Yeah, this plant is really pretty right about now because it's got the blues over here. It's like this soft minty bluish green. And then the tips of the leaves are, are pink. I'm going to layer that on afterwards. So right now I'm doing some shading and shaping with this bluish green. And then afterwards I'm going to layer glazes and build up the tips, the colors for the tips. But I'm painting really carefully because I don't want to um, make areas too dark where I want to maintain the lights. Because I, I mostly stick to traditional uh, traditional techniques with this. I'm not going to be using white if I can get away with it or you know my white gel pens because I like the more delicate look of maintaining the white paper uh, for these botanical pieces. Let's see, scrolling back to see what some of these questions are. Uh, Wildwing Acres, you said, I, I like how that pink is granulating. It's not granulating. <laughs> this is just me painting with the tiny brush and it's actually the texture that I have painted with this tiny little point. Cor Coroner Loner is asking, how long does it take me to finish one fairy creature? It really varies because it depends on how big the painting is. If it's a little teensy tiny painting, that is like the mermaids that I, the mermaid that I just posted earlier today. Um, let's see, where's that? I have that here. The mermaid. So, you know, something like this, which looks really big on the screen right now, but it is only three by four inches. This took, I don't know, I didn't really keep track, maybe an hour to do that. And versus a really large painting, which would be something that's, you know, 16 by 20 inches, that could take potentially, you know, 100 hours. So it, it really depends on the size of the painting. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing, especially since, you know, the, <laughs> the attention to detail that you see me doing right now for this succulent here and how I'm doing this dry brush shading and sculpting of the the rendering this is this is how I treat a lot of details <laughs> in the painting so when I'm doing something really tiny and small you know mermaid again you know this brush is something that can paint that pretty fast, but when I'm covering 16 by 20 inches, then it's going to take a lot longer to cover that area with the little tiny brushes I do. I mean, I don't paint the whole thing with the tiny little brush. I do do my washes and the broader areas with my big brushes. Um, and for me, a big brush is like size six, but I, I do use flats also. So I have some large, um, well, not super large, but let's see, where's one of these? Half inch flats. There, for size reference, my hand. Uh, for the background washes, and I'll, I'll lay in large areas of a wash, of a wash that way, and then build up texture, and a lot of that is through granulation and stuff, and then I go back in with my small brushes and pull out details and start shaping things. But a lot of the finest details in a painting, I do paint with size zeros. So I go through a lot of size zero brushes. Indu Zen says, it's 5 a.m. here. 
what time where I live. Well, I live in California, so for me, I've just had dinner. It is 8 in the evening for me. And so I'm just kind of relaxing here. Some quiet time in the evening. I am not awake at 5 a.m. <laughs> what are you doing at 5 a.m.? <laughs> Any masters that inspire me most for my work? LZ Tan asks. Um, John Singer Sargent is one of my favorites. Mm, let's see. I can't can't think names right now. Um, I, I like a lot of the Golden Age of illustration, of course. That has sort of the fantasy fairy tale elements that I adore so much. I love Impressionists, which seems at odds sometimes with, you know, when you see my really finely detailed work, but I love texture and I love impressionistic shapes and color and form. So those, those are things that I feel are uh, heavily influenced my work, though not perhaps in the shape, same way and form that you see in impressionistic paintings. So, you know, Monet's pieces. These are things that I, that really appeal to me aesthetically and that I chase after in my composition and in my form and my color choices. What kind of pencil do I use to sketch? I like mechanical pencils because I don't like having to sharpen things. <laughs> so I use mostly a point, point 0.3 lead, although when I get down to sketching out a painting on, uh, sketching out the piece onto my final drawing surface, I then switch to a point 0.2 lead, which is a new thing that I've been doing recently. I, I I used to only use the point 0.3, but I recently discovered a mechanical pencil who um, that has a lead advancing feature as well as this sleeve that protects the lead from breaking. That was my main problem when I was when I tried point 0.2 in the past is that the lead kept breaking, but this one has this. So let's see if I. Oops. You can see when I when I close it up. That, that silver sleeve goes away, but then when I start using it, that silver sleeve comes out and it protects the lead from breaking. I, I actually really like this pencil. It's called Orens and it's uh, Pentel. But I like that for my final drawing surface because I just, I, I like the having the really fine lines and not having a ton of graphite on my page because Having too much graphite muddies your watercolors, muddies the the paint, and so having less graphite on here means that my colors are more pure. Coroner, Lo Coroner Loner says, hope to be as good as you someday. Read your bio once that you went to UC Berkeley too. Yeah, I did. I went there for a computer science degree because when I was out of uh, out of high school, everyone told me that I should not bother trying to be an artist because it would not be a viable career. And so I believed them at first. And I went to study at Berkeley for computer science because it was a nice practical avenue. And actually, I, I do like coding. I did like coding. I just didn't love it the way I love art. Um, but I, I kind of fooled myself into believing that I could deal with that. And so I, I studied that in school. And it wasn't until towards the, the end 
that I realized, no, I really do need to make art the central focus of what I do, because if I don't, I'm going to be miserable in life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, I was actually through with my degree. I, I got through my four years and decided that I was going to try to figure out some way to make the art happen. I didn't know how, but it would because I needed to, because there wasn't anything else that I could conceive of doing that would keep me happy. Mandy Lee Art mentions Deviant Art 20 years ago. <laughs> yep. It's crazy that it's been that long. It doesn't feel like it's been 20 years. <laughs> But Deviant Art was a really good place for me back then, and so was Elfwood. And they kind of gave me a good place to start off with the art and, and kind of gave me the launching pad moving from software into doing the art full time. I'm starting to glaze in the little pink bits on the tips of these leaves. Um, else tan any book I recommend for students to stay from? Uh, you know, I, I actually never really used any books myself. <laughs> um, I, I've mostly learned on my own through experience and just, you know, diving in and, and doing stuff. So when I was at Berkeley, I actually did, I, I, I say that I did computer science, but I actually did computer science and art. I double majored. But the art at Berkeley was nothing nothing like what I do now um, because it was a fine art program that was heavily focused on modern abstract expressionism uh, which if you're familiar with it, it it does not look anything like my art <laughs> and in fact my, a lot of what I did was really frowned upon by the teachers and I remember that it was a little shocking how quickly freshmen were would learn by the first and second critique sessions how to say it looks illustrational with this sneer in their voice <laughs> so i i had to kind of hide the art that i liked to do and i i had to do it on the side in my own time and when i was doing the assignments for my my coursework i was doing at least as far as I was able to, um, the, the kind of abstract and conceptual work that was expected of us, which was a lot of throwing paint at canvases on the wall or sometimes, you know, out of the second story window, down to the floor below, um, <laughs> breaking, breaking up uh, bits of stuff that we found in a literal junk pile that was at the back of the art building where we could dig through and find, you know, discarded wood and canvas and stuff to piece together and create things. And, uh, I did, I did one project where I, I had three bottles, glass bottles, and each one I broke. I shattered them with a hammer inside a bag, inside a plastic bag, carefully. And then I puzzle glued them all back together. <laughs> Except I didn't glue them all back together individually. I glued them all back together one inside of the other. And the project that we were doing, that we were working on, that the teacher had assigned for this, um, was supposedly we, we had to do something that was meditational and for me it was very meditational trying to figure out how these bottles fit back together as a puzzle but 
the funny thing was that when I brought this in front of the class for our critique sessions, which were where everyone stands up with your art one at a time, and for 15 minutes, everyone says what they think about your art. Um, at one point, one of the teachers looked at, looked at one student's work, and she stood there for a minute, and then she just says, it sucks. So <laughs> that was the kind of thing that would happen sometimes. I remember being shocked by that and how utterly useless a critique that was to somebody. But anyway, so for my piece, though, for my, my three broken bottles thing, uh, I put that up in front of everyone, and then people started, they were really excited about it, and people were saying things, they, they, they assigned all kinds of meaning to it that I had not intended or, or conceived of when I made this, because as I said, I was just doing it thinking, you know, meditational, uh, piecing something together like this, and... And they were coming up with all kinds of things like, oh, it represents how alcoholism can really shatter a family and affect people, generations uh, into a family, you know, grandparents and parents and children. It's, it's one side of the other. And I just smiled and nodded throughout all that. <laughs> Do I use the iPad or computer to draw sometimes? I use it for my sketch process and for the initial phases of a painting, but I don't generally use it for any finished work. I used to uh, way back. I, I really enjoyed digital art back when people didn't know what to make of digital art. <laughs> um, yeah, back when I was doing those that bottle gluing <laughs> and then I, I slowly switched over to doing watercolor, and I haven't really looked back from watercolors since. I, I just enjoy it so much more. I enjoy the tactile aspect of it. Uh, I enjoy the physicality of it. So these are, I guess, a few things that did sink into me from those Berkeley art days. Um, is the, the physicality of stuff, the tactile nature of art and textures. So <laughs> that part of the art program maybe made its mark on me. The rest of it, uh, I don't know so much. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a lot. It, it definitely had the feel of of a competition for the most artsy fartsy. <laughs> I, I learned to talk about my art in a way, even when I didn't really <laughs> believe what I was saying. So I often tell people that I, I got a BA in BSing. <laughs> Oh yeah, you're welcome. And yeah, feel free to keep asking questions. I don't mind. Do you like this closer up view or do you like it to be farther out so you could see what colors I'm mixing and stuff also? got a larger brush now and it's it's got a little bit of dilute pigment on it but mostly I'm using it to blend in some of the dry brush strokiness that I've been doing 
just very lightly brushing over things because if I brushed too heavily then it would just uniformly mix everything and I don't want to do that. I want to still maintain some of that texture and I also don't want to completely lose all the shadows and definition and highlights that I've left. So it has to be a very light touch when I do this. What do I use to scan or photograph my work? Uh, yeah, so I use an Epson Expression 12,000 XL. And yeah, someone answered for me. Answered for me. <laughs> uh, and, and I do photograph when I do art, uh, when I do gold leaf stuff, because you just can't really capture the, the gold reflective quality. Uh, in a scan. Scans just really flatten that and make it sort of dead looking. So I use a combination when I have gold elements with um, scanning the painting itself because that maintains the trueness of the color as well as all the details and the photograph then gets the reflective elements of the gold. Mandy Lee Art says, do I have my own laser cutter for my frames? No, I do not. I have, um, I go to Pinoco to have them done. You can just upload online and uh, have them cut and send it to you. Although they, they actually have a location right near me, so I, I just go and pick it up. Um, I, I guess long term it might be cheaper for me to have a laser cutter of my own, but they smell. <laughs> they are stinky and I don't really have a ton of space here, so I, I prefer for now anyway to have them done by Pinoco. Uh, yeah, so I, I do them in batches generally when I have a large number of pieces that I want done. I get them all together and then and then I can do, you know, a whole show's worth of cutting all in one go because it's cheaper that way when I when I get them in large groups. What colors am I using? And what is my preferred paint to use? Well, my preferred paint, most of the time my go-to is Daniel Smith. I love the granulating. So that's, that's just, uh, that's usually my favorite for that. And so most of the colors that I have in here in my little mini palette. These are mostly Daniel Smith. A couple of Winsor Newton, which is what I used to use before Daniel Smith. Um, and so I still have some of those, some of those. And, and Winsor Newton definitely got good solid uh, colors. And there's a few of them that they have that I, I still enjoy, like Winsor Red is uh, one that I haven't found that the quinoquidrones can really match is as like a really intense fire engine red. I, I love quinoquidrones for other shades of red, for more coral or pink or orangey tones. There's just plenty of, there's a lot that the quinoquidrones are great for, um, but I still like Windsor red for just like my core red. I also use a few Holbein, like the this minty bluish color right now I have is a Holbein antique bamboo. It's this over here. And I'm mixing it with a little bit of lemon yellow or lemon tishnit, I think. Uh, and then sometimes when I'm using the mica sparkly metallic 
watercolors. My favorite for that right now is Artistic Isle. Uh, that's the, the giveaway that I just had that just ended today, which was with that set of Artistic Isle paints. But those have been a lot of fun, and that's a recent thing that I've been playing with. Uh, and yeah, I think that covers all the different paint brands that I currently have in rotation. Did I mention Holbein? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. Holbein, I have a few Holbein for some of their blues. Uh, yeah, I mentioned it for the antique bamboo, but I also like some of their other blues. So uh, some of their like deep turquoise and things. What's laser cutter used for? So I do, let me see if I can find one right now here. that I can show you. Give me a second. All right, laser cutting. So I like to, oh, I'm gonna zoom out. <laughs> it's gonna be way too close. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Okay, so this is, this is a laser cut frame that I designed and I use it for making pieces like this, where I have the art and I, it's a, it's a pretty lengthy process that I've figured out through trial and error, but I can have the watercolor prepped in a way that I can pour resin into it and do this with. So this is a small one. I have many larger size ones too. Some of them are I think the, the biggest ones I've done are like 30 inches. So, um, yeah, I do that with laser cutting because I, I wanted to make pieces that were odd shaped. And actually the, one of the, one of the reasons why I first started doing the laser cutting was because I really, really, really hate cutting mats. And, and I started, and I had started doing round paintings at some point. And I found that as much as I hated cutting regular mats, you know, square and rectangular ones, cutting round ones was driving me up the wall. And I was screwing up so much with those and wasting so much of my mat board until I figured out how to do it. But even when I figured out how to do it, I just hated doing it. And so I, I figured out this other thing was where I could do, make these frames with la with laser cutting. And I thought, oh yeah, now I don't have to mat anything. Although it takes about 10 times longer to do the, the laser cutting stuff. So I don't know if that's really a win, but I love the, re the end results for it. So still doing that. Yeah, and the, the frames were meant to be a way of sort of extending the laser frames, I mean, are, they're a way of extending the artwork outside of the the painted painted sphere, right? And it sort of pulls it into a dimensional world. Um, when I first came up with the idea, actually, I was thinking I was trying to think of some way to have a series of pieces that I was doing for this gallery up in Seattle. It's called Crab Jab Studios. Um, I had this series of paintings and I wanted to have them interconnected in a way and sort of uh, entangled with each other and sort of intruding into our space, right? And so I started with, I was brainstorming ideas and I thought initially of 3D printing some kind of connected element, um, but decided that that 3D printing was going to be way too fragile. And so my my cousin uh, Melissa Ng, she's she's an expert with all 3D printed stuff and laser cutting and molding and things. She suggested that I look into laser cutting, and so I did, and I really liked the idea of that and so I started the first series which was which was one that I debuted at Crab Jab 
and it was an experiment, but it went very successfully and I've enjoyed doing it since then. I think that was maybe three or four years ago now. Would I ever do a tutorial on how I do my gold leaf stuff? I am pretty certain I have some videos about that on my YouTube channel. Um, I lose track of, of what video has what, but I'm pretty certain I've got to have something in there. Uh, have, you, have you checked my videos to see if it's somewhere in my archives? Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure I did one where I was comparing the three different options of gold leaf, uh, 24 karat gold leaf versus like imitation gold leaf and then mica metallic paints. So I'm pretty sure there's something about that. And then a lot of my other videos, if I even if I don't specifically say this is a gold leaf video, has some element of it because I use it for almost all my paintings. I mean, aside from the botanical stuff, I have it in all of my my other work. So it, it usually makes an appearance at some point in the majority of my videos. Do I have a color palette with the Holbein colors already? I haven't, I don't have it planned, but there's somewhere in here <laughs> and I lost my color chart for this palette. So I don't really exactly remember which ones are which. So I'll have to go back at some point and redo a palette specifically with my Holbein colors. Um, all I know is that they are, they're intermixed in here with a bunch of other things. So I know that this one for sure is Holbein and I'm pretty sure that some of these turquoisey colors are as well. Let me see if I can get a piece of paper to swatch something really fast with that. So this is the antique bamboo, which I really enjoy. Uh, it is, it's sort of, it's semi-opaque though. It's not completely transparent, but it's this really pretty blue. Uh, what are these? Yeah, I have to I'll have to look up my tubes to see what these color names are because I do not remember. And that one's definitely an ultramarine. Uh, uh, yeah, this one was definitely another one of the Holbeins. But as I said, I don't remember the name of it right now. I'll have to go look it up later. <laughs> these two. Um, but Daniel Smith has a new color right now. It's a, it's a phthalo that is similar to these blues as well. That it was kind of one of the reasons why I, I went to Holbein was because Daniel Smith just didn't have that color. Um, let me see if I can find that. No, I don't know where that is right now. Another one I'll have to look up later.